Seeing with the grandiosity of the subject matter, I have been forced to, <laughs> to do this in a, the form of an audiobook. We are in New Spain, which is Mexico, around the year 1690. Section 1. Prelude. A man in a colored shirt sits down at an oak desk. Atop it are a blank sheet of paper and a black pen, and a nameplate inscribed, Bishop Manuel Fernandez de Santa Cruz. The man rolls his right sleeve and adorns the arm with noisy metal bracelets. He quickly retrieves a bottle of pink nail polish, which he places on the desk, unscrews, and begins to apply to his hand. He flips the nameplate to reveal its backside, which possesses the name, Sorfilo de Adena Cruz. The man ceremoniously clicks his pen, Cue music as soon as pen touches paper. Our narrator chimes in. The man, the esteemed Bishop Manuel Fernandez de Santa Cruz, has in his possession a poignant critique of the theological opinions of a prominent priest whose name is not important to our story. In fact, the criticisms themselves aren't so important to us either, for they were written not by the man here, but they were written by a woman. <laughs> Sor Juana Inés de la Cruz is sat by a desk covered in books and papers, leaning on her hand, working on her letters. A sister, one of her fellow nuns, disrupts her. Sor Juana, you saw one of your letters was published? The sister gestures to a paper in her hand. Sor Juana lifts herself from her work, takes the paper, and as her eyes scan downward, her expression unfurls from confusion to amusement, shock, and rage. The paper begins, a preface by Sor Filotea de la Cruz, and later the title, a Letter Worthy of Athena by Sor Juana Inés de la Cruz. Sor Juana bends to find a clean page on which to start her response, but just as she does, Sor Juana, come help us prepare the supper! La Respuesta Sor Juana leans in close to us. Since I trust you, allow me to let you behind the veil of my wooden words. I know without a doubt who published my letter, which was an unfinished manuscript, I might add. For I only sent it to but one soul, though I am forced to participate in this game of masquerades by the so-called Sofilo Thea. Don't be deceived yourself into believing I am fooled by Bishop Manuel's mask. Me and him write in opposites, and so consider the implications of my hyperbolic self-deprecation. I write, and Sor Juana reads from her paper. And thus, I left out entire arguments and a great many proofs that occurred to me, omitting them so as to be done writing. Had I known it was to be printed, I would not have left them out, were it only for the sake of satisfying a few objections that have arisen. And I could submit the latter to you, but I shall not be so careless as to set such indecent objects before the purity of your eyes. For it is enough that I offend them with my stupidities without submitting them to the effronteries of others. If of their own account these go flying about, for they are so flighty that they will do so, you must order how I should proceed. Unless your instructions intervene, I shall never in my own defense take up the pen again. For it seems to me that the one who, by the very act of concealing his identity, acknowledges error, needs no one to make accusation. As my father, St. Jerome, says, honest words seek no quiet retreat. And St. Ambrose, it is the nature of a guilty conscience to hide away. If by your wisdom and sense, my lady, you should be pleased for me to do other than what I propose, then, as is only right, to the slightest motion of your pleasure I shall cede my own decision, which was, as I have told you, to keep still. Sor Juana puts the paper down and continues to study silently. Our narrator breaks the silence one last time. On the surface, Sor Juana seems to have ridiculed herself and taken an oath of silence. But when she writes about her stupidities and Sor Filotea's wisdom and sense, when she writes of her paper growing wings and flying off to the press, she plays up society's underlying, or actually very blatant, expectation of women to be subservient and unthinking. Here, she also boldly lifts Bishop Manuel's veil, while using respected figures of the church to criticize him. Lastly, Sor Juana says that she's decided to stay silent, which she follows through on after the publication of this piece. It's impossible to get into the head of another person, and even more so one so far in time from us as Sor Juana Inez de la Cruz. But we can ask what the nature of this silence was. What significance is there that she chose this path for herself rather than someone making that choice for her? And what can we make of the irony of her writing a piece?
about not writing anymore.